Hey, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Product Managed uh, channel. Uh, and in this video, uh, we are going to basically discuss about the different type of architectures. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, monoliths. We're going to focus on microservices. And then we are going to wrap it up with discussion on event-driven architecture. Uh, before we get into uh, the discussion, I hope uh, you have liked the contents, uh, content that I've created so far, all the videos and have uh, hopefully subscribe to the channel. If not, then please please use the link uh, and subscribe to the channel. So uh, starting off, I think, uh, with this discussion, which is going to be a fairly long discussion, I uh, wanted to highlight uh, what are the three different kinds of, uh, you know, architectures. Uh, these are probably important from a point of view where you are actually getting into, uh, let's say, a, a debate between uh, various kinds of architecture. And it's also dependent on the uh, stage at which the software is, right? An early stage software basically would probably survive on monolithic, maybe, uh, let's say, architecture, right? But as you scale, right, microservices and event driven architectures will definitely overtake, right? So uh, always keep in mind that this is primarily based on uh, discussion about the pros and cons, uh, you know, a uh, big part of the discussion should also involve cost because uh, monoliths can be like fairly straightforward to implement and low cost, uh, like we'll see in the advantages. Microservices and event driven architectures can get fairly complicated and, uh, you know, cost is a big parameter of implementing those. So, Without uh, delaying further, uh, let's get into the discussion of uh, first covering the monoliths. All right. So what are monoliths uh, in terms of the software architecture? So they are nothing but like you know, the self-contained, I would say, uh, units uh, right? that include basically com components and functionality of a single software application. Right? Uh, the components are basically integrated very tightly and they form a single entity uh, you know, together. Um, one of the disadvantages, obviously, of monoliths is that single change in any system, right, can impact multiple components, uh, and which is why the scaling, uh, you know, of uh, such uh, implementation becomes very challenging over a period of time, right? So here is a straightforward example: you have a web app or a mobile app, right, and you have your standard load balancer, right? You have your uh, uh, GUI, which is a graphical user interface through which you are providing uh, on top uh, through a GUI, a bunch of services, right? Through a catalog, checkout, order, and payment gateway service, right? And all of those are actually hitting the central, let's say, database. Uh, now, the problem here is that uh, this might work for, let's say, well, for thousands of customers, right? But when you're scaling it to millions of customers, uh, right, this is not the perfect, I would say, the most perfect architecture. Um, advantages obviously, right? I mean, development is very easy for monoliths. Uh, maintenance is also very easy, uh, right? Because uh, you are aware of uh, these independent services that are bundled together under a single umbrella, right? Uh, you are not obviously looking at these services separately, right? And then all of those are basically tied to, uh, like, you know, a central where we, let's say, warehouse. This application sizes are usually small, right? I mean, uh, they do not require obviously a lot of scalability and complexity, right? Uh, deployment is easy. Uh, there is only one code base, right? Uh, all of this can be managed in a single code base, right? You can run a catalog service, checkout service, order service, payment gateway, right? Think of these as like independent functions, basically, right? Inside a single code base where you would have logic to check whether the customer has scanning the catalog, check for like, you know, SKUs within catalog, the checkout service basically following from selection of catalog, product catalog, and then order service, placing an order, and then finally a, a redirect to the payment gateway, right? Uh, so in that way, it can be developed sequential or non-sequential. The point is that you can all club, club together in a single code base, correct? Now, the debugging part is also easy because it's a single code base, right? So you would know, for example, where the failure has actually happened. Right. So it's easy to debug, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say monoliths uh, sim simply because they are, the code is uh, singular, right? Uh, testing, again, system level tests, obviously monolith applications are simple, right? Uh, you can use tools like Selenium, right? Uh, uh, why are tests simple? Obviously, because uh, one is that the code base is manageable. Uh, so you can develop your unit tests, uh, regression tests, uh, fairly in a fairly straightforward manner, right? 
Uh, the disadvantages, uh, coming to disadvantages, obviously, as I mentioned, right, uh, these are not meant to be a scalable system. Monolith architect can be difficult to scale horizontally, right? Uh, as you have to basically deploy this entire code base horizontally, right, across, let's say, multiple geographies, etc., right? Maintenance challenges will come in, right, because uh, you are growing the architect, uh, uh, increasing the system complexity. And uh, if you do not have uh, proper, uh, let's say, mechanisms in place to identify failures, then it's going to be a Herculean task, uh, right? Um, flexibility is also, I would say, limited, right? Uh, because one change here, for example, in the checkout service code would mean that uh, you know, you might have to basically make changes in the several of these, uh, uh, you know, places, maybe in the function and catalog service and checkout service, because that's how it has been designed, right, to run in a single code base, right? So it offers limited flexibility. And now the unavailability of components, right, I think that is the biggest drawback, I would say, uh, right? And why is it a drawback? So let's say, for example, there are two developers, right? One is working on auto service. They have checked out the code in Git. Right. Now there is another developer who is trying to basically do some changes in the catalog service. The other developer who is making changes in the catalog service has to wait until this code has been checked out, versioned properly and, you know, deployed in Git, right? Uh, so which is why it, it's blocker, right? So imagine if this scales to multiple services and all of the developers are basically now doing their own versioning, right, of checkout on Git. And then you have to basically wait, right? So it's a lot of unnecessary, I would say, uh, uh, you know, process challenges that will be built in, right? Uh, so similarly, I mean, this is what it explains, right? A system component is going a code change, uh, which means that, uh, uh, you know, when you're doing a deployment, the whole application will be basically unavailable, right? Which is not a good practice when you're trying to scale system, right? So I hope it gave you a good idea of what monolith system are. Whether monolith systems exist, yeah, I mean, monolith systems can exist in the initial stage of software development, right? So when you're, let's say, starting off an application uh, uh, for an e-commerce company, right? In that case, the scale might not be very large, right? But you still want to develop the functionality of how the catalog service will behave, checkout service, payments, right, returns, all of that. So if you want to develop the functionality, right, this way it can be very useful. But soon you'll realize once it starts scaling, right, you'll be overwhelmed by, like, you know, the changes that are needed in your uh you know data uh, the code database right so it's not usually suggested uh to you know have this if you are planning to eventually deploy scalable systems right so coming to scalable systems uh, uh microservices right uh, in fashion i think uh, you would have heard it from probably pretty much all developers around uh, right um I think microservices is nothing but I mean, a very fancy way of saying like collection of small and independent services, right, that communicate with each other using functions. That's how I would probably call it, right? Uh, microservices, obviously, each one has to have certain business capability. Otherwise, there is no point of developing a microservice, right? We'll see in the example below what it means, right? Because business services, basically, uh, like, you know, uh, the part of the business, that is what you want to... Uh, eventually manage as an independent entity and you want to obviously maybe scale it at some point right so always think about microservices as independent uh, business under one umbrella that is running right it makes it obviously highly flexible scalable and resilient uh, right to failure so let's look at this right continuing from our monolith example the mobile app and the web app is obviously pushing requests through the load balancer you have your standard gui right uh, what is happening here is that each of these services is now independent of each other. So order catalog is independent of purchases and checkouts and returns. Of course, these have to communicate with each other uh, for the, uh, let's say, sync. But for example, order catalog uh, can maintain its own repository of orders, uh, right, uh, independently, independent of the purchases that are happening. The purchase obviously can you know, trigger, let's say, uh, changes in the order catalog uh, based on, uh, you know, let's say, certain items have been purchased. So in your order catalog, maybe those items are not going to be shown, right? Uh, uh, but by and large, I'm saying this is going to interact, obviously, through a common user interface. And 
each of these can be scaled independently. I don't have to worry about, for example, if there are a lot of returns that are happening, right? Uh, my database can basically be uh, looking at only returns, right? Uh, updating, I think, the product catalog, let's say, uh, right? And uh, making it available in the order catalog, right? Uh, as you might have seen, I think this kind of architecture is offering advantages, which is primarily on the scalability, right? The micro, obviously you can scale it much more independently, right? There is component level flexibility. So for example, if I just want to scale this purchasing, uh, right? I'm ordering, let's say very limited order catalog, right? Maybe some 50, 100 SKUs, right? But I have a lot of purchases that are coming in, right? Uh, which means uh, there's also going to be a lot of checkout and shippings, correct? And which also means that I might have a lot of returns, right? Each of these can be independently scaled based on the volume without affecting the order catalog. In my order catalog, I'm fixed. I'm not doing more than 50 SKUs, right? So that is the advantage, right? Component level flexibility. A failure resilience, I, I think obviously, if the order catalog service, let's say, goes down, uh, uh, right? Let's say maybe you have the information stored in some cache, you can still continue running purchases, checkout and returns, right? Uh, through the 50 SKUs that are available through a cache. 50 is obviously a very less low number. Maybe probably it'll be running into 1000. But you get the point, right? Failure resistance, if basically one service fails, right? It will not impact the other services, uh, right? Uh, overall, obviously, system is more uh, stable compared to the monolith, right? Disadvantage, obviously, complexity is going to be very high. Maintenance is going to be high, right? Overhead is going to be there. Because uh, it allows, it requires you to kind of uh, maintain, uh, you know, the load balancing, for example, communication, I think, between the services here. I mean, in this example, you're not seeing it, uh, that these are, uh, you know, actually interacting. But in reality, I think Auto Catalog will have interactions with purchases, checkout, shipping and returns, right? So uh, this is, I think, going to obviously create a lot of overheads, right? Our uh, distributed database management, of course, as you see, right, I mean, each of these services is running its own separate databases, right? So transaction management can obviously be like a Herculean task, wherein each service has its own database, right? And some transactions may need to be coordinated, right, uh, uh, across, let's say, multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, obviously, uh, services, correct? So uh, uh, I hope I think uh, the disadvantages don't discourage you uh, from uh, uh, looking at the advantages of a microservice implementation. You would have still realized that there are some gaps uh, between monolith uh, and microservices, right? It's at least to me, it is not intuitive yet that this is the best form of implementation, right? Of let's say a very gigantic system like an e-commerce system, correct? So then comes the uh, 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 the final nail in the coffin uh, through the event-driven uh, architectures, right? So event-driven architecture uh, basically uh, implements the shortcomings of both monolith as well as the microservices. That's how I would probably put it, right? So here the focus is on production, uh, right? Detection and reaction to certain events. And what are events? Events can be basically anything. Events can be change in, uh, you know, state of occurrence uh, that is of interest to, let's say, particular system or system components, right? So here, for example, the change might be happening through an event, which is order catalog. You're adding new SKU. Adding new SKU is an event, right? Which might be of interest to purchases, obviously check out and shipping and maybe also returns, right? So we'll see that in an example. But just to give you an understanding of what events is, events are like, you know, any state change that can happen in an individual system or system component. So examples here, user interaction, for example, right? Completion or checkout at cart, correct? Which is an order completion, right? Uh, so it's an event, uh, correct? You call it probably like a completion event or availability of new data record. So all the returns in a particular time interval, let's say return payload is going to push it to a central warehouse, correct? So these are event types, basically, you can say. Uh, each of these, uh, uh, you know, is uh, basically uh, defining an event on which you can allow and build out the systems to interact with one another, right? Uh, message brokers, very fairly used, uh, commonly used to publish and consume events asynchronously. We have touched upon this concept, if you recollect, in message queues, right? 
so which is uh, very similar, um, you know, uh, this architecture is based on that. Uh, publisher services is not aware of consumer of events, right? The publisher service is just publishing the events, consumer service is just consuming the events. We'll get into the example of what do you mean by publisher and consumer. And then uh, obviously this event driven architecture is mostly implemented with a publisher subscription pattern, right? Uh, you basically publish to a central, let's say broker, and then subscription events are allowed to receive notifications when certain events occur, right? So now let's get into the uh, architecture of this. So again, sticking to the same, let's say, uh, website, uh, 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 you know, e-commerce website or e-commerce store, basically, uh, kind of architecture that you want to implement, right? So here you have, for example, a store website that is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, looking at the new stock or the SKU, right? Uh, then there is a mobile app, which is a, a let's say, a user who's trying to inquire about the item availability. Now these are events from each of these independent systems. So whether a new stock or an SKU, right, is present in a, a, a let's say, store or it is added to a store, it is published to an event broker, right? Whether the item is available or not available, the customer is inquiring. That is also an event. It's pushed to an event broker. This event broker has an interaction with a lot of consumers. There is a central warehouse consumer, there is a transaction system consumer, and there is a support system consumer, right? These are different systems basically. So item availability check is being pushed uh, to the central warehouse database. I am basically inquiring whether a particular item is available or not available. The event broker is basically pushing it to a consumer. Consumer is this central warehouse, right? And then it is obviously going to respond back um, you know, uh, through events, and then you obviously might have a let's say a notification system in place where which is where is giving you an, an a, let's say availability if it is not available. If it is available, you'll probably see it right now. Coming to I think this part where the store website added a new stock, right? Uh, new stock obviously is queue that you have added, you have to push it into the central warehouse, right? So this event broker is going to help you do that. Now, let's say you wanted to do a return, what is the sequence going to be, right? So return will obviously originate from, let's say the mobile app. You are going to push that event stating that this is the item that I want to return. The support system is going to basically come into picture wherein they get an inquiry about return. They are going to alert both the transaction system. So think of this transaction system as a payment or let's say a financial transaction system. It's going to push information about that item. What is the, let's say cost of that item and uh, obviously, the central warehouse also where the inventory record is there, right? You have to update that. So that also needs to be updated, right? So one return basically, let's say that is happening through mobile app is triggering pretty much all the consumer events, right? So this is the advantage of this event driven architecture that based on the events alone from one system, all the consumers can be interacting, uh, you know, independently which means that it is the backbone of a very highly scalable system, right? You can create, uh, uh, you know, asynchronous events uh, interacting with each other at a very high scale, right? So um, advantages, I think responsiveness, you can obviously look at like, I think real time uh, events that can happen, uh, you know, system can be highly responsive, can build very high responsive system. Scalability is definitely better than microservices because you're allowing the event broker to consume the events and uh, also, uh, sorry, publish the events and consume the event. So it is highly modular, obviously, and scalable as both the publishers and consumers can be scaled independently. I can scale these side of the client, uh, sorry, the client here, uh, uh, server side, right? On the mobile app or on the store website or whatever it is, right? I can scale this independently. And I can scale this side, which is the consumer side also independently, right? So uh, both the publishers and the consumers can be scaled independently, which is why it makes the scalability very high, right? The fault tolerance, obviously, uh, near real time or let's say very high fault tolerance is required. This is very useful because I can live with my support system failing. In reality, you will obviously have replicas of support system, but I'm saying in this example, in this diagram, if your support system fails, you are still going to be able to check for the item availability, right? Or let's say you're doing a return here. I mean, I can still update the central warehouse and do a transaction return in the account of the uh, person, right? 
I don't have to wait for the support system. In reality, obviously, as I mentioned, there could be like master and slave kind of, uh, you know, replication on this so that system don't go down. But I hope you got the concept that uh, it allows for a very high fault tolerance. Uh, security, right? I mean, layers of access controls can be implemented at whatever like level, right? I mean, I can push this behind uh, a, a layer, uh, uh, right? Uh, a security layer, uh, and I can do that similarly for transaction. I can introduce layers of authentication, uh, uh, you know, uh, services or layers before the transaction system because this requires, let's say, more security, right? Transaction systems have to be highly secure, right? So independently, I can add layers of this, right, uh, or layers of security, uh, right. So, um, what's the advantage? Disadvantages, I mean, mostly it will be on the cost side. Complexity is highly complex, obviously, to maintain. So it means you need to have good understanding. Uh, your engineers need to have good understanding of event-driven designs, right? Uh, which also means that you are going to spend a lot of money in hiring those folks, right? Event storms can happen because high volume of events let's say for example can storm this broker which is simultaneously going to start pushing out events to the consumers right so there's a possibility good possibility of storms and then event versioning right this is going to be another headache so for example you updated the transaction system right now you will have to update the code base to tell the support system and the warehouse and uh, uh, let's say uh, all the uh, publishers that are pushing to the event broker that the transaction system has been updated to whatever new version which means old version which was being used earlier has to be rolled out which means all of this basically now needs to be pointing to the newer transaction system right so it's a definitely a lot of uh, i would say headache to maintain the event versioning and backward compatibility right um and you obviously have to do it on both the publisher side and the consumer side. So that is, I think, the big, biggest, like I would say, like, you know, some of the di biggest disadvantages. But that shouldn't stop you from thinking about these in a very highly, like, you know, complex or scalable fashion. These kind of architectures do exist. Uh, Apache Kafka, I think, a distributed, obviously, streaming platform that is uh, an EDA, uh, you know, a driven architecture. And Lambda, AWS Lambda, is a serverless computing platform. I think Google also has it, I'm forgetting the name, but I think Google also has uh, this event-driven architecture implementation. So I hope, I think today's video was useful for you guys uh, and uh, you got good understanding of the different kind of architectures. Use it in your system design interviews to start the discussion, right? And then draw out the advantages of one over the other and then try to conclude where you want your systems to be actually like, you know, in the short run and in the long run, right? So uh, until the next video, uh, oh, please do like and subscribe to my channel and uh, stay, uh, uh, you know, healthy.